I've made it a habit of uh, running three miles every day, and I would have to admit that this walk up here leaves me a little more out of breath than the end of three miles. And it is a humbling experience to occupy this pulpit, which has been occupied by such great, great men in welfare services. Sometime after the collapse of the Teton Dam with the ensuing flooding disaster, which affected several counties in eastern Idaho, while serving as the area welfare leader, I was asked to speak on behalf of the Church to a group of people who were responsible for civil defense and disaster relief. They included representatives from city, county, state, and federal organizations, as well as a number of religious, volunteer, and service groups. The requested topic was how the LDS Church is prepared to respond to emergency crises. I realized that they had already observed the response of the Church to the flood. They saw firsthand how the Bishop's storehouse system was almost immediately prepared to ship in truckloads of supplies and then they stood by to fill the requests of the local priesthood leaders. They saw the Deseret Industries help bring order out of chaos. Large mountains of clothing were donated from many parts of the country and were placed in large, unsorted piles. There were party dresses with work shoes, small sizes with large, men's with women's, and cleaned with soiled. In a very short time, the Deseret, Industry, Deseret Industries had these much-needed articles of clothing cleaned, pressed, sized, and placed on racks from which those in need could choose for their particular needs. They saw how the social services was available to help the people in their social and emotional needs as emotional tolerances were pressed to the limits. There were many jobs that were lost due to the flood and many new ones that uh, were created. And LDS employment was busy as employees and employers were matched together. They saw, as did people from all over the world, the many thousands of volunteers who came at their own expense to help in the cleanup effort. And many of you were a part of that great army who did so much and were appreciated by so many. There was a need in the early days of the flood cleanup for heavy equipment, and a request was made for tractors and front-end loaders from stakes both near and far. We thought in terms of five or six outfits. Soon after the request was made, the area welfare leader from Soda Springs, approximately 165 miles away, called and said, President, I understand you need some tractors and front-end loaders. We're ready and prepared to bring 150. I told him that 20 would be marvelous. <laughs> there was a need for electricians to restore the power to the homes who had the, the electricity turned off because of the flood. We estimated that 150 would be a marvelous response. And that call went out. We didn't get 150. There were more than 450 licensed electricians and helpers who responded to that call. This same type of devotion and dedication was shown many, many times over as a variety of needs were fulfilled. It was evident to this group to whom I would speak, as well as others, what had happened in this major crisis. But were they aware of those who are helped every day on an individual basis? For example, the young girl who found love, understanding, and kind assistance from social services when she was confronted with a major crisis in her life and because of wise counsel did not compound an already serious problem with a more grave tragedy when she found that there is an alternative to the accepted worldly philosophy of abortion. They did not know of the many other services of social services 
The childless marriages were with loving homes who are blessed with the opportunity to uh, adopt a little infant. The Lamanite program, professional counseling, foster homes, and others. I was sure that most of them did not totally understand the Deseret Industries and most certainly did not understand that it is a living example of the principle of the Law of Consecration, where each of us have the opportunity to freely give of our surpluses, and then the lives of those great people who are not willing to be spectators in the arena of life are given the opportunity to maintain their dignity by enjoying the blessing of work. Perhaps they were not even aware that the Deseret Industries is open for all to come to make economic purchases which are so helpful in meeting the pressures of an infl inflated economy. Shopping at the Deseret Industries is like shopping at an exclusive store. There are many items there that are one of a kind, and with shipments arriving daily, we have a new opportunity to make new choices every day. On one occasion, as I had arrived early at the Deseret Industries prior to our monthly meeting of the local operating committee, I made a tour of the well-organized displays and racks of commodities when my eyes were drawn to the area of overcoats. One of them particularly appealed to me. It was a fine, all-wool, English-tailored coat, and I thought to myself, if it fits, I'll buy it. And I looked at the price, $4.75. And at that price, I knew it would fit. <laughs> I bought it, and I paid cash for it. <laughs> I took it home, and, my, and when I modeled it for my wife, I put my hands in the pocket, and there I found a number of collector-type one-cent postage stamps. And I guess they were probably worth about as much as I had paid for the coat. And I suspect that I was probably the only person who had ever made a purchase at the Desert Industries where I had not only made an excellent purchase, but I also received stamps. This group of people to whom I would speak certainly had no way of knowing of the father who found himself with an understanding bishop exclaiming, Bishop, tragedy has struck our family. I've lost my job and I need welfare. To which that knowledgeable bishop replied, Brother, you don't need welfare. What you need is a job. And you have come to the right place. That great bishop had just taught the great principle of work. The bishop, and that bishop's comment was not just an idle remark, because he had available to him, as part of the great storehouse system, a ward employment specialist who has accessible to him not only the employers within the ward and stake, but also through the employment center those throughout the entire area. If a job could not be found in the open market, that same employment specialist becomes a resource to the bishop to help find meaningful work opportunities for the needy brother within the Lord's plan, thus allowing that father the joy of maintaining his dignity by working for the commodities received. This same employment system serves the needs of all members as they seek employment and to upgrade their opportunities. This group of interested people that I would speak to wanted to know what we as the Church can do in a major disaster. But brothers and sisters, that is not all. There are heartaches, there are hurts, problems, Yes, even disasters which occur in every life at some time. And in that individual's life, those personal disasters are just as real and just as deserving of our help as those who are inv involved in the flood of eastern Idaho or the earthquake in Guatemala or the flooding in California. 
I wanted this group to know that in the Church we are not only prepared to deal with major disasters which involve many, but His plan provides for the loving care of each of His children on an individual, one-on-one -on -one basis. Those of us who are here today have at our disposal the principles of the welfare plan, which assist us in helping to bless those who are in need. I give you my solemn witness that we are engaged in His work. May each one of us strive to carry out our stewardship so the work may be done in His own way. The work and labor which we perform in welfare services will lead us steadily forward to that time when we will be blessed to live the great law of consecration in a Zion society. May each of us be found doing our duty. I pray in the name of Him whose planet is, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.